All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. <coughs> going to begin reading in verse 1. I've, I've kind of challenged us to uh, try and memorize this chapter. How many of you are at least trying it? Would you raise your hand? At least trying it? Okay, that's good. It's about, uh, about 10%. Nah, 25%. How many know, can memorize a couple verses? Maybe. Would you, oh, you could do that. All right, let's read it together when I say begin. All right, ready? Begin. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now we're in verse 4 tonight. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. All right, we'll stop there and we'll pray together. Father, we thank you for this evening, and I pray as I preach the message you've led me to preach, you please help me tonight? I need a fresh filling of thy spirit. I need you to guide and direct my thoughts and words. And use me as an instrument, Lord, for your glory. I pray you'd speak to people's hearts tonight. Do the work that only you can do. Again, I ask if someone's here tonight that's not certain of their salvation, that they would get saved this evening. That today, indeed, would be the day of salvation for them. And then for those of us that know you, that you'd help us in this subject that we've been dealing with for a little while here the subject of charity or love in action. Uh, so please bless the message again, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, tonight again we're continuing with the series, as you notice on your sheet at the top. It's entitled, To, live is to, to Love is to Live. Uh, it's loosely based on the book by uh, a man named Spiros Zodiates, and it's a good book, it's an older book. But uh, it's a series that's really dealing with the subject of charity, and that's what we're talking about. Uh, charity, of course, is God's agape love in action. That's what it is. You say, what's the difference between charity and love? Well, it's similar. One is just what it is. The other one what it is what it looks like. It's love in action. Now, the reason that we're spending time on this subject, I believe what led me to this, uh, uh, the reason is twofold. One, because of the commands that we are given in Scripture to love. I mean, it's all over the Bible. Over and over in the Word of God, believers are commanded. You and I that know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are commanded to show God's agape love uh, to others. We're to show God's agape love, first of all, to all men. Uh, not just the ones we like, to everybody. When Christ Jesus was asked, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? And of course he answered, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, notice, hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Imagine that. 
1 Thessalonians 3, 12. And the Lord make you increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Uh, Galatians 5, 14 kind of echoes what the Lord Jesus Christ said, where we read, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If we would just do that, then we would fulfill all of the law of God. If you would understand what this charity love is and do it. Uh, 1 Timothy 1, 5, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. On and on I can go. So we are to show love to all men, but especially we are to show love to fellow believers. Right. You say, well, that's harder. <laughs> Sometimes it is. You say, why is that? Well, we spend a lot of time together. Amen. I mean, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we serve the Lord together. We Amen. know each other. We see us in good times and bad. We go through things together. Right. But uh, we're still commanded to love one another. Show that agape love one to another. John 13, 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one another. Imagine, the world's going to recognize that we are indeed disciples of Christ. Not necessarily by our standards or our stand, but by our love one to another. It's something they're going to look at and say that is miraculous. Uh, that's only God that can do that in the heart of a person. 1 Peter 4, 8, and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. And so because of the commands in Scripture to love, that's what led me to this series, but then also because of the confusion in the world about love. Again, we, we said this earlier to the world, love is a feeling. It is an emotion. It is a, uh, they see it as a softness, uh, as a permissiveness. Uh, to the world, love would never call out wrongdoing. Love would never confront people about their sin. Love would not discipline their children uh, in a stern way, if you will. Uh, to the world, love would never refuse to give a person whatever they want. Uh, I mean, they see that person with the brown sign on the side of the road, uh, uh, you know, homeless, God bless you, anything helps. Uh, I think they mass produce those signs now. And uh, people think, well, I love them, so I'm going to give them something that's not necessarily love. If you don't know what's going on in their lives, maybe they're using every dollar to buy cigarettes and alcohol and whatever. I don't know. But the point, it is, the point is this, don't claim that to be love. Uh, uh, to the world, that's love, though. Uh, to the world, love would never refuse to help people regardless of their circumstances. But again, uh, God's love, God's agape love, Amen. is much different. And so what is God's agape love? I don't have it on this sheet, but I think this is a good definition. Again, it is a self-sacrificing act that is done for the spiritual advancement of another, the spiritual benefit of, of another. Now we get that from John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he agape the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, Amen. but have everlasting life. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, God is trying to show you his agape love. He died for you, went to the cross of Calvary, bore your sins in full, and all you have to do is merely repent of your sin and trust Jesus Christ Amen. as your Savior, right. and you can have eternal life. Now, God's agape love is always designed to do not necessarily what the recipient wants, but what is best for the recipient. That's what God's agape love is. So, 1 Corinthians 13, let's look at it here. Uh, Paul begins uh, to deal with this subject of charity. It's called the great love chapter, the great charity chapter. It is perhaps the most comprehensive description of charity in the Bible. It not only tells us uh, what charity is and does, but also how it does it. And that's what we're looking at uh, uh, tonight. Now remember, he begins this chapter with, uh, by describing to us really the importance of love in the first three verses. That without charity, our words, our knowledge, our intelligence, our teaching, our preaching, and all the things that we do, all the works that we do, will profit nothing if it does not have a charity. So imagine, that means that the degree that our Christian life influences others for the Lord is directly proportionate to the amount, to the amount of charity that is present. It really is. In other words, we can do the same actions, the same ministry, the same work, and it does not have charity, it won't have as much fruit as if, if it did have charity. 
But then in verses 4 through 7, and we've been kind of working our way through this, God gives us the description of charity. And he lists for us in those verses 14 things that will be evident if charity is present. Now, we looked at the first two, which are positive. Notice, charity suffereth long. Uh, and uh, puts up with others we talked about, their personalities and shortcomings and people's idiosyncrasies. We suffer long. Uh, and then is kind. In other words, we respond to that, uh, to people with a kindness and a sweet disposition. Now he's going to get into the next eight characteristics, and they are actually going to be negative. Notice, charity suffereth long and is kind, but the next eight have the word not in it. And so uh, tonight, we're going to look at this first negative characteristic, and that is this, that charity, notice, envieth not. It envieth not. In other words, if we're going to show God's love to others, if we're going to exercise this agape love, then one of the things that will be absent is envy. And so tonight I want to preach on this subject here. I know you're thinking we haven't even gotten to the blanks yet. We'll get to them. And that is this. Uh, notice, ridding our lives of envy. So tonight let's look at what exactly is this thing, envy. And I think we pretty much understand it, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. And then why would God say that charity envieth not? Let's begin with number one, the definition of envy. The definition of envy. Now, the English word envy and its forms, envieth, envy, and so forth, are found in 40 verses in our Bible, kind of divided almost evenly, 21 verses in the Old Testament, 19 verses in the New Testament. The Old Testament Hebrew word commonly used and translated envy is the word kana, and the New Testament Greek word and here in 1 Corinthians 13 is the word zelu. And uh, both of these words, basically, they mean, obviously, the same thing. Now, notice the definition here of envy. When we're talking about envy, and we're talking about envying not, uh, here's what envy is. Envy is this. It is a feeling of discontent and resentment aroused by and in conjunction with a desire for the possessions or qualities of another. I'll say that again real quick. It's a feeling of discontent. I get discontent or I'm aroused, resentment is aroused by when I see someone that has something that I want and I don't have and I get upset with that, that's what envy is. That's exactly what it is. If I see somebody that perhaps has, uh, more about this later, but has more stuff than I have, more things than I have, maybe they're smarter than me, or they're more talented than me, or they're further along in their career, and my response is I get bothered by that, I get upset with that, I become discontent with my own life, that, my friend, is envy. That's exactly what it is. Uh, Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines it this way, very similar. It is discontent excited by the sight of another's superiority or success, accompanied with some degree of hatred or malignity, and often or usually with a desire or an effort to depreciate the person and with pleasure in seeing him depressed. In other words, I get upset, so I want to put that person down because I'm envious of what they are or what they have. Uh, Bertrand Russell said this, quote, Envy was one of the most potent causes of unhappiness. And it is. Many people are unhappy today because they are envious of other people, of their lives or of who they are, and so they become discontent and miserable with their condition. That, my friend, is envy, and charity envieth not. Envy is actually rooted in pride and self-centeredness. Because guess what? It's all about me. That's what my life is about when I have envy. It is a sinful jealousy of another. All right, three quick things about envy. I'm going to shoot these out quickly. Number one is this, or letter A. The world is filled with envy. Right. That's how they function. Right. 
Romans chapter 1 and verse 28 and verse 29. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Watch this. Being filled, talk about the world now, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. That's what the world is according to God and we see it ourselves. By the way, sh social media is a breeding ground for envy. I'll say it again. Social media is an absolute breeding ground for envy. Fake book is not reality. It is not reality. You are not seeing what people's lives really are. I hope you get that through your head, young person. You're not seeing them for what they really are. And those types of things, social media, causes people to envy what other people have. Envy them. And so the world is filled with envy. Let it be. Also, the worldly are filled with envy, according to the Bible. Right. The worldly are filled with envy. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. For ye are yet carnal, this is verse 3, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? If you get caught up with the same stuff that the world gets caught up with, with this Facebook and social media and desiring what other people have, understand something, you are filled with envy. And the Bible says that's a mark of carnality. So the worldly are filled with envy. Let us see. The works of the flesh include envy as well. When you look at Galatians chapter 5, and there's a contrast there between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And of course you get that long list of the works of the flesh in verse 19 of Galatians chapter 5. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, and envyings. I'll stop there for time's sake. And, and so again, that is what envy is. We find that the world is filled with envy, the worldly are filled with envy, and the works of the flesh include envy. If you are walking in the flesh and you're not walking in the Spirit, if you're not filled with the Spirit of God, you are going to manifest envy in your life, and so will I. All right, so number one, we see the definition of envy. Number two, let's talk about the display of envy. What are some things that can cause us, or people in general, us, even believers, to be envious of others? In other words, to have that feeling, and more about this later, of discontent and resentment uh, as I see somebody uh, that's excelling or have a quality that I want. Uh, what are some of the things uh, uh, that causes envy to be displayed? All right, number one, or letter A, is this. Sometimes we are envious of the prosperity of others. The prosperity of others. Let's go over to Gale I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 26. Now, there is so much, you know, this is one of those messages, and guys that preach know how this works. You start off thinking, what, what am I going to preach about here? Then when you start digging, you say, wow, I, I have so much to preach about. What am I going to put in this thing? But that, that word envy is all over the Bible, and there's a lot of situations about envy. But notice Genesis chapter 26 and verse 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. That's a good thing, isn't it? Right. Here he is, he's sowing in the land. Verse 13, and the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. Here is a man, Isaac, that is becoming very prosperous here in material things. And it was God blessing him. But notice verse 14, for he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants. And the Philistines envied him. They wanted it. They envied him. You see, sometimes when we see other people prosperous, if we're not careful, we'll envy them. Right. There'll be envy in our lives. Uh, we, when they're prosperous, for example, uh, number one, would you write this down? Personally. Sometimes people prosper in their personal lives. Uh, for example, they, they get a great job. They have a wonderful job. Great benefits. Sunday's off, 
Wednesday nights off. Amen. Can get Jubilee off when they ask. Amen. Should I go on? No. Uh, maybe they have a nice house, a beautiful house. Uh, they're able to do that. Or, or they're driving a nice car and God has blessed them. They have new things. Uh, they're able to go on vacations uh, that uh, when we look at, we can't afford it. Uh, they can buy things that we can't afford. And when, uh, when we see that, watch this, it is when that bothers us that we're guilty of envy. When we look at that and say, why don't I have those things? That is envy. Amen. So we can look at the prosperity of others and become envious when they are prosperous personally. But we can also look at the prosperity of others and when they prosper in ministry. Amen. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, their church is bigger than ours. They're running more on their bus route than I am. I'm looking at the bus ministry and I see that my route isn't doing as well. Or I look at the numbers in Sunday school and I look across the hall and I see that, boy, their Sunday school class is growing and mine isn't. Uh, or maybe other churches, uh, uh, even of like faith, we're seeing and uh, they're seeing more people saved and better attendance than us and more people baptized and more people added to the church. Uh, or, uh, or maybe uh, that pastor down the road, boy, he gets asked to preach at that such and such conference and, uh, and we don't or whatever that may be. Understand something, if those types of things bother us, right. we're guilty of envy. We're guilty of envy. So we can be envious, again, at the prosperity of others. Then number two, uh, the back, we can also be envious at the personal characteristics of others. You know, Matthew 6, 27 says this, Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit under his stature? Right. In other words, who can make themselves taller? Right. Can anybody? Nobody can. Now, we have a tendency to make ourselves wider, but we don't make ourselves taller. We can't do that. That seems pretty easy, doesn't it, just to get wider. But, uh, you know, it's a recognized fact of life. When we, we look at each other, we're all different. Right. We are. It's amazing to me, you know. I mean, nobody, even, even twins, they don't look exactly alike, even though I have, I know, I got problems with trying it. But anyway, they, there are differences there, right? We're, we're all different. Uh, uh, and uh, we, everyone comes in this into this world on, not on equal footing in that respect. Right. Now, we all come in equally in the fact we're sinners right. and we're deserving of hell. We're all on the same playing field there. Right. But other than that, we're all different. Right. And we have been given by God Amen. different abilities. Right. Different skills, and I know some things can be developed. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about naturally. Uh, naturally, we have been given different aptitudes. Uh, uh, some people can uh, score way well on their SATs, and some can't because they just can't. They don't have that aptitude. We've all been given different appearances. We look different. We've all been given different opportunities along the way. Not, not one of us chooses what we look like. We don't choose that. We don't choose our hair color. We don't choose how long our hair stays in. We don't choose our eye color. We don't choose the shape of our ears, the, uh, the length of our nose. Uh, we don't choose our parents. Uh, we don't choose the environment we were born into. And we don't choose the home that we grew up in. I mean, and, and then go to our personalities. Our personalities, we're all different. I think I said this on Sunday, don't confuse personality with spirituality. That's an important thing. Some people are bubbly. I mean, they come into a room and you know they're there. And then there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but they just take over a room and they're just, you know, just a joy to be around in that respect. You never have to worry about a conversation. There's always going to be one there. But others are, are quiet. Uh, some of us uh, go unnoticed. Uh, uh, our abilities are different. Again, some have been given musical talent. Again, you develop a lot of things. I get that. Uh, but our abilities to teach the Word of God and to preach the Word of God, uh, we're all different. Amen. My point is this, uh, is that the, the personal characteristics of, of us are different. And understand, if that bothers you, if you look at someone and say, boy, I wish that were me. Why aren't I like that? Why can't I have those things? Uh, if that bothers you because they're more skilled or talented or their appearance or whatever, then you are envious. Right. You're guilty of envy. 
Why aren't I taller? Why aren't I smarter? Why can't I deliver the word of God like those guys in Jubilee, you know? I mean, we all think that way, don't we? But if it bothers us, then we are guilty of envy. So we can be envious at the prosperity of others. We can be envious at the personal characteristics of others. We can be envious, number three, or letter C, at the promotion of others or their achievements. You know, God picks people. Amen. Not to be saved. Brother Dr. Dameron almost jumped out of his seat right there. <laughs> We're not Calvinists around here. Amen. But God does call people into the ministry. Amen. He does. And uh, he chooses to use people. Go back to Genesis chapter 37. We know the story of Joseph, right? If you remember, Joseph, again, uh, uh, as we get into Genesis 37, look at, I think it's verse 11. But if you remember, Joseph, God revealed to Joseph in that dream, dreams really, that he was going to rule over his brothers. And you remember that. And, uh, and, uh, and even his parents, and he'd rule over his parents. Uh, and, of course, uh, Joseph shared that dream with them. And uh, that God was actually, uh, we know as we read later, God was actually uh, picking him to be used of God uh, to really to feed the world, if you will. But notice in Genesis 37 and verse 11, and his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. In other words, they thought, well, who do you think you are? What, are you better than us? You, you, you think you're, you, why would, you think God would choose you over us? That's envy. That's exactly what it is. And we need to be careful about that. Do you remember the disciples? They were filled with envy on several occasions, actually. When they asked the Lord in Mark 10, 37, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. In other words, choose us. Boy, when he gets there, choose, don't choose them. Choose us. Oh, certainly you choose us. You see, envy, what it does, envy gets upset when someone else gets to promotion at work. Envy gets upset when someone else gets the position at the church. Well, how come they got to be a deacon? And I didn't get to be a deacon. How come they get to, 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 to serve and teach that Sunday school class? And I don't. Uh, how, how, how come uh, they get to be on staff? And uh, this I and I don't. Uh, uh, that's what envy does. That's exactly what it does. Uh, it gets upset uh, when someone else gets Promoted. And then letter D, write this down. Also, uh, envy, we get envious uh, at the providence of God. So again, the prosperity of others, the personal characteristics of others, the promotion of others, then the providence of God. Since you're in Genesis, maybe you're not, but go back there. Chapter 30 and verse 1. Look what Rachel, what happened here with Rachel. You know the story here when, when the, they were having... Uh, Jacob and Leah and the handmaids were all having the children, and uh, Rachel's sitting back and wondering what's going on. I mean, Leah had uh, Reuben and Simeon and Levi, and then, uh, of course, uh, Rachel gave the handmaid Bilhah, and uh, Bilhah had Dan and Naphtali, and then, and then back to uh, Leah, who had more kids and so forth, and, and Rachel had none. And so she's looking at... Uh, how God blessed, because really God controls that, right? And, and look, at, uh, look at chapter 30, verse 1. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. It bothered Rachel when God gave Leah children, her sister, and not her. So I want to ask you something. Let me, well, let me ask you this. Who controls that? God does. God controls that. And so there's certain things, understand, that are out of our control. But when we look at them, we kind of think, we know God's in control. And so we, but we say, why does that happen to me and not them? If it's something bad, if it's something good, why does it happen to them and not me? Does it bother you when uh, someone else is, has, seems to have no health problems and you got a bunch? Does that bother you? When uh, someone else seems to have less problems in life than you do? I feel like you're getting everything coming down the pipe and everybody else seems to be skating along just fine. 
is bothering you? That's envy. That's what it is. Uh, when, when, when someone else seems to, it seems like everything falls in place for them. Not for me. That is envy. That's how it's displayed. We can be envious when someone else is prosperous. We can be envious of the personal characteristics of others. We can be envious of the promotion of others. And even the providence of God, we can be envious of Why not me, Lord? Why don't I get these blessings and why do, why do they get it? Number three, write this down, the danger of envy. I told you we'd go through this quick. Do you know the Bible has the danger of envy? You know the Bible has nothing good to say about envy. You go through all 40 of those verses, you'll find out. Thumbs down. Not good. Uh, Proverbs 14 and verse 30 says this. A sound heart in, is the life of the flesh. Watch this. But envy the rottenness of the bones. You see, if you're a person that's envying others, envious of them, that they're getting something you're not, uh, and you just, uh, what, what happens is it's going to, it's going to rot your bones. You're going to die from the inside out right. if you don't get a hold of this thing. Amen. Because there's a war going on inside of you, inside of your mind, right. this idea of something that shouldn't be there. And it's all rooted in pride, which is resulted in envy. Proverbs 27, 4. Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? You're going to cry all your life saying, that's not fair, that's not fair. I should have got that. Why didn't I do that? Why did this happen to me? Life isn't fair. You're right, it's not fair. The By the way, if it were fair, we'd all be in hell for all right. eternity. Amen. Anybody want fair? I, I don't, Amen. okay? Not me. Amen. I, we just have to trust God that he's doing what he's doing. And we'll get to that here in, a minute, here in a minute. So notice what envy results in several things. This is what's going to happen. Letter A, write this down. Discontentment. You're not going to be, you will never be content when you are envious of others. If you go to that Facebook every single day, Instagram, whatever social media, whatever they are today, and you start gleaning at other people's lives and ooing and eyeing about, look at them and all the fun they're having, and here I am sitting at home ironing clothes and doing laundry, and they're out there uh, by the lake and in canoes and at the amusement park and going to the zoo. Man, my life is miserable. That's what's going to happen. By the way, hang out with those people a little while. You're going to find that's not their life. I said that Amen. already. You will absolutely become discontent. You will not be content with who you are. You will not be content with what you have. Right. And you will not be content with where you are in your life. You'll think everybody else is passing me by. And here I am just sitting here trying to get by day by day. Boy, the world is just moving on. And here I am left behind guilty of envy. So again, you will, it'll result in discontentment. It'll also, it could even result in resentment. You can start resenting people for that. That's what envy does. It resents people. By the way, it even can resent God. Lord, why, why is my life the way it is? And you get upset. Why can't I be like this person or that person? You will be a miserable person to be around right. if you are caught up in this sin, Amen. and I say it's sin right. of envy. Amen. And then letter C, write this down. Also, it also results, envy results in complaining and criticizing. Right. And I'm going I'm to expound on that here in a minute. What you're going to do, you're going to complain about everything right. and criticize everything. Right. And then letter D, anger. You're going to get angry. You see, here's what happens. People that struggle with envy, they see others that uh, seem to be going well and doing well, and they look at their lives, and they get angry about that. And uh, what they do when they're envious, uh, they will uh, really denigrate and belittle those that they envy because they have to put them down to make themselves feel better. Well, that person's successful, yeah, but you know what? They're just blah, 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 blah. They're just going about something else. So they denigrate or belittle that person that they envy in order to make themselves feel better. Then number two, they'll elevate, this is not on there, but they'll elevate themselves above those that they envy. Make themselves look better. Well, I do this and that. And then they'll even have animosity towards the people that they envy. 
One author wrote this, quote, Envy has to do with feeling unhappy about the success of someone else. There's some people just, I don't know why, they just, I don't know, it's like their spiritual gift is making other people miserable. <laughs> they see somebody happy, and we're going to put an end to that. We're going to take care of that. There's no happiness around here, not while I'm here, you know. <laughs> That's how it's going to happen. And so envy has to, about the success or about what they have and at the same time secretly feeling inferior themselves. You may find yourself wishing the other person would lose that quality or possession in order to make things seem fair. Uh, envy is a very destructive sin. Doesn't help the harmony of a church, by the way. Right. Doesn't help the harmony of Christians, by the way. If we're looking and comparing one another and envying and putting people down, that's why charity envieth not. More about that in a little bit. It is what one author called an ugly emotion. And if you have it, you better get over it. Because you're not helping yourself. Amen. And you're not helping anybody else. Right. And you're not expressing God's agape Amen. love. Charity envieth not. So how do we... How do we stop that from happening? Yeah. By the way, the flesh always wants to envy. Right. Amen. Why, why did they get that and I didn't? Right. Why did that, ha that good thing happen to them and not me? How, how come someone gave them something but they didn't give me something? That's envy, by the way. Right. How do we depart from that? That's number four and we're done. Number four, the departure from envy. Amen. Well, we've gone full circle. And so we see, see what our verse says. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Amen. The way to rid yourself from envy is to exercise charity. It's to exercise God's agape love. Right. Charity envieth not. You see, the goal, remember the definition of love and the goal of love. The goal of charity is the spiritual advancement of another. Right. That's what we want. We want, others to, we want others to advance spiritually. We want everybody to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, remember, life is not about you. Right. It's about the Lord, Absolutely. and then it's about others. Right. You should be, and I should be, last on the totem pole. Right. And so how do I rid myself from, en uh, uh, from envy? Well, charity. So what do I do? Letter A, write this down. Charity craves the best for others. That's what we should want. Philippians 2, 4, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of love others. We should want to see other people advance. We should want to see other people grow. We should want to see other people uh, improve and get recognized and become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We should want to see a, a church a greatly used of God and a person greatly used of God for the cause of Christ. That's what we should want. What if we, one of our church plants grew three times bigger than ours? What we say, well, what's up with that? We started you. We're the mother church here. No, we should rejoice in that. Amen. Why? Because we crave the best right. for others. Hallelujah. We should want others to succeed, even beyond where we are. Amen. Sometimes, well, I taught that guy, and he's over here you know, doing much more for the Lord than, than I've ever done as far as volume-wise. No, it shouldn't be like that. Thank God. Amen. Thank God for that. Let it be is this, charity also celebrates over the blessings of others. We should be happy when others succeed. We should be happy when others get blessed of God. We should be happy when someone succeeds financially or in their career. Again, as long as it doesn't uh, avoid, you know, get into conflict with the, with the church and all that. We should be happy for that if they get a raise. Uh, we should be happy when someone's leading a bunch of people to Christ. Uh, we shouldn't say, well, did they really get saved? And, well, I want to make sure they get saved because nobody does it like I do. Come on now. Right. We should rejoice. They got saved. They trusted Christ as Savior. We should rejoice in that. Uh, we should rejoice when others uh, are influencing others for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we should be happy when other bus routes and ours grow, when other Sunday school classes and ours grow. It shouldn't be. We joke about a competition, but it's, uh, it's okay. You know, he beats me every week. You know? <laughs> anyway, but that's okay. Because charity envieth not. It celebrates over the blessings of others. 
You know, we should be happy if God sends revival anywhere. Amen. Right. You know, some people are like, well, if it doesn't happen here, it ain't going to happen nowhere. Well, I hope it happens anywhere. Amen. Really, we need it. Our nation right. needs it. We shouldn't look down our nose and say, well, I think that needs to be here. They didn't do it right and all that. Stop already. Right. We should celebrate over the blessings of others. Then lastly, number three, charity is content. And this is a big one, with what God has bestowed upon us. You know what uh, one of the causes of, chari- of, of envy is? Discontentment. Right. We're always looking at others. Right. They got a bigger house. They got a nicer car. They got more stuff. <laughs> they can go on more vacations. They can do that. Well, praise the Lord, they can. Amen. Don't envy them. Right. Rejoice in them. And be content with what God has given you. Right. Amen. If it's not about your character, you're not working and all that, that's a whole different story. But God blesses people differently. Right. And we're all in different situations. Right. I mean, there's, you know, all kinds of people have health issues and all kinds of things. But be content with where you are and trust God. Philippians 4.11, not that I speak in respect of one, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith Amen. be to be content. Let's stop looking at the things of others right. and getting upset because we don't have those things that others have. That, my friend, is envy. Amen. He says, it's hard to do, preacher. It is hard to do. In fact, it's impossible to do right. without Amen. the Lord. Because if you remember, we talked about agape love. Right. It's not coming from here. You know it's coming, you know coming from here? All those works of the flesh in right. Galatians chapter right. 5 wrath and evil right. surmisings and envying and right. strife. That's what's in you and that's Amen. what's in me. God and that's what would come out naturally right. if the Spirit of God was not controlling Praise us. Jesus. And so we have to yield ourselves to the Lord right. and understand it's not, it's not about us. Right. It's about us Amen. encouraging others and wanting the work of God to grow and people to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Praise Jesus the Lord. Christ. Amen. And so if God blesses somebody else, God blesses Amen. another church, God blesses another bus route, another Praise Sunday school class, Amen. we ought to be happy for that right. and be content and do our very best in the situation that God Thank has you, given Jesus. us. Amen. Ridding our life you, of envy. Right. It's a good thing to have. Charity. Right. It envieth not. 